are privileged to watch it. We have here Member of Parliament for Ofwasi Ayerebi and um, a legal practitioner as well. And we have uh, Kujo Ponkroma. Thanks for joining me, Kujo. How are you? Mm. How are you doing? Um, I'm good. I'm good. I see that you've been going around uh, speaking to Joy FM and speaking to a number of media houses as well. Yeah? Well, yes. Uh, as part of our exercise to, may I say, prepare the grounds for the President's address this morning. Uh, what really is going to be the preamble for his address? What should we be expecting in the first place? Well, first, uh, and as I say good morning to your viewers, first we must understand why the president has to do this and what is expected of him, and then we can get to that stage. We are here today on the invitation of the Constitution. The Constitution, by Article 67, invites us, uh, the president and parliament in this session, to come so that the president will deliver a message on the state of the nation. And so essentially what the president is required to do today is to deliver a message. Is he going to deliver a message of doom? Is he going to deliver a message of hope? Is he going to deliver a message of substance that shows clear direction in where he's going? Um, it's also a time where we've just finished the transition. We are privy to some material. People have expectations based on the promises we have made. You put all of these together and the president will deliver today a message quite brief but heavy on substance that accounts without lamenting to the nation what we have inherited and begins to draw a road map to where he is going to hit with regards to the promises that he has made to us throughout the campaign period. And even though he's not going to do a bullet by bullet mention of all the sectors of our national life, the principal ones which, for example, if you read chapter 6 of the Constitution, the directive principles of state policy, the principal ones that are mentioned therein, the economy, jobs, energy, health, education, security, he will speak to some of these and even at times give specific programs of what he intends to do in these areas to turn things around. But generally, his message in um, uh, response to what the Constitution requires of him is a message that will be more focused on what it takes to achieve the promises he has made to us. And critically, we should say uh, the president really has made promises uh, for which already uh, we, we seem to be burdening him and exacting a lot more responsibility for him than usual. Uh, excessive pressure. But it is right. The president is very cognizant of the fact that we are not in ordinary times. We are at a time in our nation's history where our problems are so precarious that you need a president who is one, clear in his mind what the challenges are, two, has a quick strategy, and three, most importantly, is ready to run to deliver the results. And so he welcomes the pressure and the expectation. You would realize that he actually every time says, yes, I know people are asking, and I'm committed to it. I know I have to act with urgency, and this is what I want to do. We are five weeks into his presidency. His ministers are literally uh, you know, all in place and have started going about uh, their work. And today, you're going to see, unlike other premier you know, state of the nation addresses, he's going to outline policy in specific areas this early, five weeks into his administration. And I think it shows a sign of a president who is quick on the bubble, um, you know, quick in the mood to get things done. Mm -hmm. Already he started that uh, outline, outlining what the line items as far as um, the basic responsibilities of our normal parent who as a child in senior high school would be uh, by announcing that policy just two weeks ago. Uh, and, and already there are concerns about where we're going to f fund that policy from. Those concerns are genuine and are welcome. Whenever you hear a bold, audacious vision, it is right to ask how is this going to be funded. But it is also right to be cognizant of the conversation that has gone on over the years. Free SHS is not a concept that was just mooted a month ago. From 2008, President Akufuado, then candidate Akufuado, has been talking about the need to give life now to that constitutional provision of FQ. And he has, over the years, outlined a number of sources. He's talked about the GET Fund. He has consistently talked about digging deep into our petroleum revenue. He has talked about looking at other sources of funding to bring life to this vision of his. Now, recently, you had the uh, finance minister, um, I beg your pardon, the former finance minister and now the senior minister go into some bit more detail of how, when it comes to the petroleum uh, revenues, 
it is the desire or one of the considerations is to see how it can be realigned. All of these conversations are going on. Some agree with some parts, some disagree with some parts. The good thing is that when the economic policy of government is brought before parliament next week, which is the budget, you will see clarity on what the government has decided should be the roadmap for funding free SHS. But it is beautiful to hear this conversation at this point in time, to hear various people bringing various views. I agree with this, I disagree with that. That's the beauty of democracy. At the end of the day, the government will come to parliament, the finance minister will come to parliament with a clear answer, which we would now have an opportunity to pass into law or to maybe disapprove. My mind goes back, for example, to the national health insurance debate. It's possible, it's not possible. This will impose a burden, it won't impose a burden. The beauty of that conversation guided the decision makers at the end to arrive at a decision that worked. Take um, um, what we call the talk time tax. Another beautiful conversation, people disagreeing. That's the beauty of our democracy. But at the end, the finance minister will come to parliament with a clear economic policy and they will have an opportunity to vote on it. And giving us all the indications that really free SHS is a way to go if we want to de develop the next level of human resource for our country and make sure that even for the average ones, they are at par with uh, some of the best practices and what the growth are in many developing countries. It is because at the heart, this government led by President Akufuado believes that one of the major things we must do to give life to our promise of independence when uh, President Nkrumah at the time said the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. We must build the capacity of that black man and that is through education. His belief is that the state must owe it a duty to every child born and considered a Ghanaian citizen, every child participating in education in Ghana. The state must have a responsibility because when the state considers its responsibilities to provide cars for ministers and cars for members of parliament and office for that, it all costs money. The state must add to its responsibilities, the responsibility of educating its citizenry to the senior high school level. That is the philosophical underpinning of that policy, and that is why he wants to go there and commit resources to ensure that it sees the light of day. A sector that came under great scrutiny was energy. Uh, we know that we had gone through a protracted, if not a prolonged period of uh, power cuts, which ultimately affected the industry and even the ordinary domestic consumer. Uh, in the first year of uh, an Ekufuado led administration, especially when he's about to give the State of the Nation address, uh, there are critical things that need to be looked at. Yes, and indeed the Energy Minister has been working behind the scenes to avoid near misses in our energy situation. We have not been in a haste to, uh, you know, spread panic, but he's been working behind the scenes to um, avert near challenges. Um, today you will hear the President speak boldly to the energy challenge and some of the medium and long-term solutions that he's envisaging. I think what will happen is that subsequently the Energy Minister will have to uh, maybe even brief the nation on some further detail. But you will hear today how the president intends to tackle the broad energy challenges and ensure that we have enough energy supply to fuel the industrial drive that he has talked about so often. He's talked about the fact that we need to move from this Gagisberg economy to an economy that deals more in value addition. Value addition requires a lot of energy, but we cannot get there if we don't permanently solve this perennial energy challenge. And today you will hear him speak to how he intends to deal with it so that we have the energy to achieve the industrial drive that we've been talking about. For even civil society or some policy think tanks in the sector, and even the minority uh, over the last year or two, had been worried uh, about even some of the agreements we've uh, struck with some of the IPPs because ultimately they translate into what the consumption costs will be. Is this something uh, the Kufuado-led government is worried about or things that uh, needs to be uh, looked at? I don't want to go into too much detail and take the wind out of the president's say. Suffice to say that all that needs to be done to arrest the back and forth we've had in the energy sector is being considered and will be handled, including cost, including agreements, including long-term solutions. You can rest assured the president is dealing with these ones. He will spell out which specific ones he's beginning with and the broad remit that he has given to the persons who are handling the sector for us. But Ghanaians 
can be rest assured that he's considering all the options to deal with this thing once and for all. We're bringing to you a live coverage from Parliament where the President, Nanado Dankwe Kufado, is going to give uh, before parliamentarians uh, the first of the, of the State of the Nation address by him and his administration. And uh, we'll bring you a lot more exclusivity on many of the issues we've been discussing, just in case you want to get interactive. Uh, please uh, log on to our Facebook page, Join News on TV. We've linked that to our Twitter handle, uh, Join News on TV. You're already seeing pictures of former president and his wife, John Rawlins, and Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rawlins as well. Uh, just like him, we have other dignitaries who have made their way into the chamber as well as the public gallery of parliament, and we'll be witnessing this historic event as, uh, again, mandated of the president by the constitution. And uh, again, Kujo Oponkroma, Member of Parliament for Ofwasi uh, uh, Ayuri. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, I've been there before. Ah, I see. Yes, I've been there before. But in the meantime, though, let's move on to the subject of um, taxes and, and mainstream uh, liabilities that confront the ordinary entrepreneur and businessman. We're, we've already had the Ghana Union of Traders come forward to say that they would want uh, these things tackled heads on immediately as uh, the Nanado led government could. So, uh, again, it's important for us to all understand the rhythm with which these things work. Today, we are taking the State of the Nation address, as I mentioned, personal to Article 67. Next week, the Finance Minister will be here to deliver what we call the economic policy of government for the year 2017. Remember, we have a budget which is running from January to March. It will end this March. That budget includes revenue and expenditure measures. Now, the NPP coming into government and President Akufuado's government has promised an adjustment of the revenue side, dealing with some tax um, relief, some tax removals. Those will be outlined, or we should expect those to be outlined as part of the economic policy. That's when it will be properly tabled before Parliament. The President may or may not today hit on those, depending on which areas he wants to go. But the actual right place to expect those to be boldly outlined is in the budget statement to be delivered next week. I'm expectant that, as has been mentioned to us, some of those nuisance taxes, some of those taxes that make it easier for entrepreneurs to invest and do business expecting higher yields will be outlined in the budget statement. If the president chooses to hit on some of them today, it's a bonus. But I'm looking forward to the budget statement to speak specifically to the economic policy agenda of this government. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be something we should uh, behold. But uh, if you look at taxes and, and some of the reliefs that need to go to uh, various sectors of the economy, uh, there seem to be a plethora of them. If, if it could be for charges at the ports and even for the corporate sector, etc., it, it, it will mean that there will be a dent in whatever revenue that would have been the accruals and what things being equal and that's the beauty of economics all things being equal there should be a dent but that is why when you are introducing an intervention like that you also introduce other measures that would ensure that you achieve the objective you are looking for <clears throat> so one of the things you will see very clearly in the budget statement when it is read is efforts at improving tax compliance because sometimes when you raise the tax rates so high and compliance is low you end up getting a net low. But when you focus heavily on tax compliance and you reduce even the tax thresholds, more people are, like we say in normal parlance, brought into the tax basket. So all things being equal, that is what should happen. But when you do that expectant that you are also introducing around the same time uh, uh, a tax compliance program that ensures that more people are brought into the tax net. So you are lowering the rate and you are broadening the tax base. You will get net more. And that's what happened in 2001 when the Kufu administration reduced corporate taxes from 32% to 25% and invested in tax compliance. You saw us achieving more. We also do know from economics that uh, this whole concept of tax avoidance comes down, Ketsi, like we are told, the Laffa effect comes down when tax rates are brought down and you are able to now encourage more people to see that their taxes are being put to good use. It's been you know, tested here in Ghana and we have seen the evidence and that's the kind of policy that is going to be brought in by the finance minister when he outlines the economic policy of government uh, later next week. So I'm hopeful that putting these things together, reducing the rates, broadening the base at the same time, we will achieve net more to grow this economy. 
Thank you very much, and thanks for passing through Kojo Pong Kroma, Member of Parliament for Ofwase Ayuribi. And uh, we will again go to George Riafe, who is speaking to a number of personalities and would want to get a lot more exclusive interviews to some of those individuals he's speaking to. And so uh, over to you, George Riafe. But uh, again, we're bringing to you live pictures from from Parliament, and uh, you can see just on your screens the former president, Jerry John Rawlins, as well as his wife and a number of uh, personalities in the chamber.